She wanted anonymity, but she told me she was prepared to speak out because banks had been lying to customers about these charges for years. And they're systematically overcharging us uh, for financial services, for underwriting and things like that. Uh, so they're cheating the taxpayer, uh, you know, over and over again. I've seen proof of the true cost of bank charges. I wonder if the managers at Barclays know the truth too. So stopping a check or something or bouncing a direct debit costs the bank maybe a pound fifty, two pounds stamping charges, but we bill the customer 30 quid, 35 quid. So that's a bit unfair, a bit unrealistic yeah. and harsh. I've been in Barclays for more than four months now. I've seen customers lied to from the outset. I've seen a culture so sales driven that staff turn to corruption in an attempt to meet their targets. And I'm resigning because I feel the ruthless sales culture at Barclays is an abuse of customers' trusts. When I came into the bank like five years ago, I knew it was a sales job. It's going to get worse rather than get better. They agreed to meet me at their headquarters at Canary Wharf in London. I told her I'd seen staff trained to lie to customers, to deceive them into taking a call. I am a, an account consultant from Barclays Bank. That's in clear breach of our policies, actually. I'm afraid your instructor was not complying with our rules. What I've seen has shaken my trust. Lying and cheating were all in a day's work for some staff under huge pressure to sell. Because people know we're a good bank, we're trustworthy, we do the right thing, we treat people with respect. But I told her I'd seen a culture of contempt for customers. And my attitude is, look, I don't know you, I don't care. Do you think that's an appropriate attitude? Absolutely not. And I'm quite shocked to hear that case that you've just described. Given what I've seen, do you still think it's still reasonable to ask customers to trust you? So I say, I don't think what you've seen is in any way representative of the way in which Barclays does business. And as I left, I couldn't help thinking that the view of Barclays from the corporate headquarters seemed a long way from what I'd experienced on the ground. People at the Buckley's claim they do not use in their work media files from the Internet, even if the information is important for the Buckley's. In particular, one of the Buckley's vice presidents told me, quote, we are blocked via our network to view YouTube content. Well, it appears that in fact there is an official Buckley's account on YouTube. But the Buckley's internal team seems is prevented to see the products they design for external usage only. Why? I guess for two reasons. For two hidden reasons. First, it's simply useless. There is no really important information at the Buckley's YouTube account. It's just a waste of time to watch it. And secondly, the Buckley's seems purposely invested a lot to create its almost absolutely useless appearance on YouTube, to hide really important information about the Buckley's. And that information is mostly negative. So probably a real aim of the Buckley's PR policy, if you want, is to hide from the public a lot of negative information about the Buckley's. I can give you just one example, just one example. Two years ago, the most important news about the Barclays was unveiling its fraud with the LIBOR. And I remind you that that was an $800 trillion question. So what the Barclays did to hide the news at the Internet? In particular, from the YouTube, it claims today it's not 
an important source of information for the Buckleys. So, what the Buckleys did was creating a lot of useless videos that included the word Buckleys in their names. Just enter right now the word Buckleys on the YouTube search engine and the most of information you will get in result on one of the biggest and oldest bank in the world will be about its entertainment center only, about music, about football, rather than any financial details of the real Buckleys activity. Friday was the opening night of the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Some embraced the change. Well, entertainment is an important, of course, but only if it doesn't prevent public from knowing how Barclays really earn its millions, billions and trillions. This guy, Jamie, you know, Jamie Dimon, telling me, oh, no, no, we got this thing figured out. We got complicated risk analysis. It's, no, you don't. It's a casino. You're gambling. What's going on? Oh, well, we just, we've installed a casino in the lobby. It's the new sort of transparent marketing campaign from Barclays. Cool, it's, where, uh, so it makes sense. Yeah. So we're just embracing the fact uh, that it's just a big casino. So it's a bit like working for Barclays, but it's an actual casino. Yeah. It's exactly what we did with the banking interest rates. And when you take that much risk, what's going to happen? At some point, you're going to lose one of those gambles. And when you do, you don't have to pay the bill. We all have to pay the bill. Bob Diamond has been carrying out very successfully in New York as casino banking. And he regards the fact that Bob Diamond is taking over the whole of Barclays Bank as a sign that a casino is effectively taking over a retail bank. We've got to end this rhetoric around casino banking. The facts aren't there. The rhetoric is just too loud. Barclays assets rest on derivative bets. 416 billion. One huge last question remains. Has the firm been making record profits with your and my money? A recent IMF working paper describes how the world's top 10 banks, including RBS and Barclays, have taken advantage of the freewheeling shadow world of derivative trading to do what would otherwise be impossible. Together the 10 have risked $1.6 trillion of money they don't have. That's 1.1 trillion pounds. So like nearly everybody else, you lost a great deal of money on uh, property and derivatives. Look, a colossal amount of money. But, but there is a silver lining to it all, if you, if you look hard enough. Is there? <laughs> yes, luckily I lost other people's money and not my own. I would describe the Barclays Bank as a nice beautiful building which is, however, built on the sand. If you argue that my price for settlement with Barclays because of its bad quality of service starts from a million, I would mention the actual schemes the Barclays uses for evident manipulating its prices on a regular day-to-day -day basis in much greater scale. Partly it's because of using different types of money. In a way, the first floor of the Barclays Bank the ground floor, if you wish, consists of deposit money. It's mostly paper money, but it's real money. The second floor consists of money for loans which banks is able to create from a thin air. And it's about 10 times bigger than the first one because of so-called money multiplier and fractional reserve practice. 
The third floor of the Barclays Bank consists of mostly virtual values like stocks, credits, default swaps and the like. And it's much, much bigger than the rest of the floors. Only the sky is the limit, I would say. They don't have the money. Yeah, they have the money, but they need your money so they can keep gambling. Doesn't anybody get it? Derivatives are essentially cheap bets in which two parties, banks or companies, gamble on future movements in financial prices. Supposedly, they help the buyers or sellers manage risk. Some do, but many are no more than invitations to speculate on a massive scale. These are people who sit at desks in front of television screens, two telephones in their hands, shouting at each other. They on the whole think that they're quite talented. Actually, what we, what we did was we went to Las Vegas and we watched major bank and speculators blow all the money and then transfer that debt to us. So we're tightening our belts to pay somebody else's debts. It can be avoided provided that governments and central banks give us, the financial speculators, back the money that we've lost. <laughs> But isn't that rewarding greed and stupidity? No, no. It's rewarding what the Prime Minister Gordon Brown called the ingenuity of the markets. That is the... Uh, Финансисты никогда не платят. К этому нужно попривыкнуть. Они жестко наказывают за долги себе, но никогда не платят свои долги. И по этой причине необходимо устраивать форс-мажор. And as Barclays along the way refused to return my money, and by the way, it was an incredibly small amount, but it was the money I earned fair. So my first step to protest against such Barclays attitude was compiling all the best videos on the internet on the libel scandal the Buckley's wanted to hide into one big movie which I put on the internet. It's the crime of the century. It should be headline news. It affects virtually everyone on the planet. Tonight, in London's Mayfair, are the Oscars of the financial world. The award for innovation in interest rate manipulation. And the award tonight is the finest bottle of Bollinger Champagne. Benefiting hundreds of millions of pounds from rigging LIBOR. But today, the winner is... Oh, I heard Robert Diamond, the former CEO of Barclays, say he was sorry. Look, you just saw it. You just saw it with, with Barclays. You know, this guy resigns, Diamond. I'm sorry. And that's it. Whoa, I'm sorry? Oh, and he left with $100 million. That's what he's worth. You know, so no, they, they, it's not going to see anything other than a breakdown of the system and people demanding justice on their own. If you have financial terrorism in America, which we absolutely do, I mean, we have people that, I'm going to mention a few of them, that not only have been instrumental in taking away one of the most important components of any free market, which is trust. The Barclays, for example, they keep getting caught over and over and over again in crime after crime after crime. Well, people are really worried about getting caught and even being indicted in that world, that's the end of your career. You're never going to make money again. But they don't have fear of that anymore. They know that if anybody gets caught, the absolute worst thing that's going to happen is that the company is going to pay a fine. And that's not going to come out of their pocket. That's going to come out of the shareholder's pocket. 
And so there's no fear of individ individual punishment. And that's the problem. You're talking about fraud. Should some of these bankers get arrested? Absolutely. I mean, the only person who's gone to jail in this entire financial crisis was Bernie Madoff, right? But each one of these real estate deals was really a little Bernie Madoff. I mean, that's really what it was. They're, they're all these, these little Ponzi schemes, each one of them. Uh, you know, it's essentially the same kind of investor fraud and nobody's gone to jail and certainly somebody should. This is an amazing pan global manipulation scheme out of the city of London once again focusing on LIBOR. It's a massive manipulation of interest rates that affects all the currencies around the world including the Chinese. Max Kaiser tweet, next time Geithner accuses China of currency manipulation they can point to LIBOR. The next time they have this conversation China's going to say to Timmy Geithner, look you know you're the manipulator. Stop manipulating LIBOR. The second you stop manip manipulating LIBOR is when, you know, we'll consider your requests on the currency front. And of course, Timmy Geithner and uh, Mervyn King and Bob Diamond and his associate at Barclays can't stop manipulating interest rates because if they did, this entire system, instead of collapsing in six months from now, it would collapse in six minutes. Every swap is a two-sided transaction. Now, maybe you pay me on the S, you know, you pay me on the S&P 500, I pay you LIBOR. You pay me on Greek credit default, I pay you LIBOR. You pay me on 10-year notes, I pay you LIBOR. In other words, people focus on the bet, whether it's a 10-year note or a stock index, but they ignore the fact that the other side of every swap agreement in the world, practically, is LIBOR. The LIBOR scandal has proven without a shadow of a doubt that Bank of England and Barclays and the money center banks are manipulating interest rates. So why should we be surprised that they're man manipulating silver and gold? I mean, silver is the inverse of, of interest rates. So it's even if you admit it or not, by manipulating LIBOR, you are manipulating silver. This the two things are part and parcel. Silver is a currency. Gold is a currency. If you manipulate LIBOR, you're manipulating precious metals. That's, that's an axiomatic truth. This whole derivatives market has to be taken as gross exposure, not net exposure, and fraud on the LIBOR is just opening up this Pandora's box. Right, they break the LIBOR market. It's a multi-hundred trillion dollar market. It's the base rate that determines all other rates, you know, uh, going around the world. It's like the Federal Reserve discount rate in that way, except it's bigger. It affects a, the whole entire global economy. They got caught rigging those markets because most people equate the financial industry as being quote victimless uh that there it, it, it's just paper moving around there's no crimes attached to it there would be no co co coercion attached to it your thoughts carl oh it's absolute nonsense max the the fact of the matter is i mean you know look at the libor scandal for example there have been people that have said well you know, for every winner, there was a loser. If you if you got overcharged, somebody else got loaned money at a at a lower rate. And and I will simply observe that I can make the same argument for auto theft. If I steal your car, there are still the same number of cars that exist in the world. The mainstream media is focusing on, well, it was great for homeowners because their mortgage rates were lower. However, on the bad side, municipalities paid more for their credit default swaps. But nobody's looking at the whole frigging financial system has been blown up. Jamie Dimon pulled the strap. He blew up the entire financial system. Now the LIBOR rigging, it, the Barclays emails exposed that they, the reason why they were doing it was a lot to do with their derivatives positions that day. A company that is taking some of the most innovative minds the academic and financial worlds have to offer. company that is using their talents to become one of the fastest growing investment banks. This is about pay for performance. Based on whose analysis? The people who put pen to paper and use a dividend discount model tied to LIBOR? <laughs> what value? There's no value. There's no accounting. You can't have a value without accounting and there's no accounting. Uh, there's complete complicity by the troika of fraud, the media, the fund business, Wall Street, government. Don't talk to me about value. I'm trying to find out if high street bank customers have any idea of the size of bonuses that the bosses of their bank earn. Um, extortionate amount. And I just wondered if you knew how much of a bonus he received last year. I don't know. Half a million? Mm, no. Shall I tell you? 2.14 million pounds bonus. Lucky fellow, right? I can't find anybody who does. Are you seeing people who are still able, through the bonus that they receive, to be able to come and buy a house like this 
full cash. Простите ради интереса, у любого сколько ты получаешь? Он же обосрется, будто его просят исповедаться. You know how much the average CEO now gets paid more than the average worker? 380 times more. Now look, we know the CEO is going to get paid more than the average worker, everybody knows that, but it used to be in the ballpark of about 40 to 1, which is pretty high. Now it's 380 to 1. Remember, these aren't even entrepreneurs, this isn't Bill Gates, this is just a manager. In 2006 and 2007, you were paid about 20 million pounds a year. Now that's a thousand times more than the average Barclays teller gets paid. Can you be worth a thousand times more than anybody at Barclays? So you think a thousand times more than the average Barclays teller is well, appropriate? I don't know where you got your cal calculations, um, but I, I don't, I, you know. Well, 20 million? 20,000, uh, one is a thousand times the other. Well, I do the best I can um, uh, to deliver. Well, Bob Diamond must work million times more, million times harder than, for example, me. He definitely doesn't, neither you, Sir David Walker, nor your chief executives can work harder than, say, a thousand people in your bank. It's simply impossible. We have only 24 hours a day, and no one physically is able to work some extra thousand or million hours per day more. You can only evaluate your income higher if you are at the higher virtual floor in your building. And the fact is, there exists a different evaluation for the price of job at your higher floors. I am fighting for a fair settlement of just one million because I am depositor of your bank who stays at the low first floor, so to say, while just scale of income for people at higher levels is much bigger. And there they believe it's absolutely fair, don't they? I'm simply starting playing your rules, Sir David Walker. What's really happening is that they are altering the way they're paying people so that they can say to the public, we're actually paying lower bonuses, but most of the people in the organization are actually getting just the same money as they were before. No industry compares to investment banking in the amount that's set aside for pay, typically 40% of the money that's made, an extraordinary industry norm. All that has changed since the crash is the balance between bonus and base pay. Barclays, what they've done is they significantly increased the base pay of some of their people, which means when the figures come out, the proportion that's bonus has actually dropped. First of all, most of it wasn't bonus. Most of it was deferred and in, in uh, uh, equity. The basic salaries, which shall we say, an individual earning a million pounds, was get a hundred thousand pound basic salary and nine hundred thousand pound bonus. Today they're getting three hundred thousand pound basic salary and a seven hundred thousand pound bonus. The, the bottom line is that since 2000 you've taken home more than 480 million dollars. That's almost half a billion dollars. And that's difficult to comprehend for a lot of people. Your company is now bankrupt, our economy is in a state of crisis, but you get to keep $480 million. I, I have a very basic question for you. Is this fair? If I was the Prime Minister, I'd ban the use of fairness as a word because I don't think you can be fair. I was um, involved with Barclays for many, many years. Uh, Bob Diamond and John Varney made a huge difference to Barclays as they went through uh, that's a terrible period. And in that sense, uh, when they were both there, their pay was fair, in your view? Well, actually, I think John Varley was underpaid, actually. But... John Varley is the chief executive of Barclays Bank. Last year, his salary was £975,000 before bonus. My letter and phone calls haven't produced the offer of an interview. I'm at Barclays Canary Wharf HQ to try and meet chief executive John Varley. Uh, I'll come see John Varley, your chief executive. Okay. Let's just, uh... I want to ask John Varley about the £2.6 billion worth of bad debts that his bank has had to write down over the last year. 
you stop him in business? Okay. I won't be able to ask him about it today. John Varley told shareholders that they have endured a lot. He's acutely disappointed by the fall in profits and has promised to improve the bank's position in the future. Isn't that rather a lot of money to pay someone who, after all, did so much damage to his company? We can all understand big rewards for success, but this, this is a reward for failure. Oh, no, no, it's not a reward for failure. It's compensation for failure. <laughs> and they probably think it's worth paying £12 million pounds to stop me doing whatever I was doing to the company. <laughs> What's fundamentally unfair about the collapse of Lehman is its impact on the economy and taxpayers. Mr. Fold will do fine. He can walk away from Lehman, a wealthy man who earned over $500 million. What sort of incentives are we talking about? Well, um, large sums of government money. Uh, that's the sort of thing, really. And, uh, but you see, you must understand what bankers do. We don't make furniture, we don't write novels, we, we, we make money, that's what we move money around and so we're keeping, you know, a lot of it for ourselves is what counts for us as job satisfaction. So as bankers you're going to have to go back to doing the simple things. The simple things, exactly, and you know, I mean it's quite nice, really, you know, after years of making money out of things I didn't understand, it's rather nice to make a bit of money out of something I do. Which is what? Which, well, essentially, uh, paying savers next to nothing and charging borrowers lots. I mean, I, I, I'm not very good with figures, but I do understand that. Uh, Mr. Fold, you said earlier in your testimony that at Lehman Brothers, when things were going well, then people would do well, and when things weren't going so well, then people would have cutbacks. And I have to say that I think people looking in have concluded, based on the compensation structure, that when things went well, people did really well. And when things didn't go well, they still did uh, very well. Well, you know, over the, over the last decade or so, it's been, it's been very up and down. Sometimes I've had good years, sometimes I've had incredibly good years. <laughs> Reach for the stars and you can rise So don't look back tomorrow Step outside and feel no fear You have to go and build your future just walk away and shed no tears I say goodbye I say goodbye I say goodbye to you Because the LIBOR scandal has attacked the viability of the global interest rate market as a whole. The entire institution is now coming under attack. It's not just the corruptly gained profits at Barclays. It's not just the totally false picture that's been given of the condition of banks when they're basically zombie banks. And it's not just the fact that nearly a thousand trillion, that's perhaps 15 or 20 times the worth of the global economy, a thousand uh, trillion uh, of contracts have all been falsified. The seriousness about this is that this latest revelation uh, is part of showing that the whole system, which is arrogantly stated to be always efficient and always having just outcomes, is in fact false. It's here's Nick Clegg, the Liberal Democrat, saying pensioners must give up benefits. No, Nick Clegg, pensioners must revolt against the corrupt Bank of England that's stealing all their money with your help, Nick Clegg. Explain that while you're out there calling badgers. Pensioners did give up their benefits when LIBOR was manipulated down and their pensions were defrauded. I will shed at least one tear. City of London will be uh, just a, a, a pathetic backwater instead of the financial centre of the world. Now think of the billions which flow into London every day, or used to. Think, <laughs> think of the enormous amount of tax revenue that generates. 
But people like you hardly pay any tax. No, but think how much it would be if we did. <laughs> I want to talk about institutions that take in uh, funds from a number of, uh, of savers, um, oftentimes uh, uh, small savers, and find uh, a useful investment opportunities for these funds. What people don't realize is that bank advisors aren't really advisors, they're salespeople. The bank gets a whopping commission from any money invested. If it's an investment bond, they take 7 or 8% straight off. Uh, for other investments, 5%. The way Barclays has run rings round the regulators and is cheating tens of thousands of investors of compensation for bad advice. A year or two before the crash, Barclays persuaded 12,331 people to invest in very high risk funds and told their customers they weren't very risky. People lost a fortune, the funds went down by 60% and Barclays is liable for their losses because they didn't tell them how risky the funds were. It's quite inexcusable. I was employed by Barclays for 25 and a half years till I was made redundant. I like, invested money in the Barclays SAYE share safe scheme all, for years while I worked there. I, when I cashed 10,000 myself, I was approached by their financial advisor who advised me to go in the Morley Fund. And Within, I think it was about 18 months, my, my, my holding had gone down by 40%. What very few people know, and that's what we went to the House of Commons to, was that um, Barclays has, has done a dirty deal with the regulators, the Financial Services Authority, which means they're not paying the right amounts, and in half the cases they're paying nothing at all. I say goodbye. Jenkins, the new head of Barclays, does he speak about this wealth transference and his, uh, his, his quest to clean up the city of London? No, because he doesn't want to point the finger at what is an obvious scam that he's a part of, Jenkins. Barclays has appointed Anthony Jenkins, who's the head of its consumer banking business, as CEO in succession to Bob Diamond, who resigned following the libel fixing scandal. Oh, Jenkins? I mean, that's a perfect name for, you know, a major D at a second rate restaurant somewhere, you know, in the backwaters of East London. Why don't you get that job instead of, you know, abusing us with your platitudes and nonsensical uh, statements from your CEO slot, Jenkins? They're rigging gold like they rig the stock market, like they rig LIBOR, like they rig everything. It's one inside deal. And so they need to keep the price of gold down so that they could keep the Ponzi scheme afloat. And I think the reversal will happen when no one is looking. And when the no one is looking, it's going to be when we go into wars. That's when you're going to start seeing the reversals start to happen because people will be focused on different things. What do you think of Wall Street incomes these days? Excessive. By 1986, he was making millions of dollars and thought it was because he was smart. Now, look, again, if we had a fair system and the CEO gets paid more than the average guy, of course he does, right? And he makes a lot of money and it doesn't take very long for him to get <laughs> to buy milk? Okay, no problem. But we don't have a fair system. These CEOs have all the tax breaks to their advantage. The average person in the street would find it difficult to understand how you can lose billions of pounds in irresponsible investments and lending. How you've created and they have fueled and created a lot of debt both in, our, both in our own economy and elsewhere, that, and that the price of that is, for them, is to walk away with suitcases full of cash as bonuses. There was an unspoken truth out there that it would go wrong someday, but by then you'd have your bonus, you'd have built your conservatory, you'd have bought your car, you'd have paid off your mortgage. So who cared about the future? when bonuses were now. Right, he couldn't use the CEO defense. That he doesn't know what's going on in his company, like Damon, uh, Jamie Dimon does all the time. He's like, well, I'm just a CEO, what do I know? Where's my bonus? <laughs> yeah, in fact, the Supreme Court found that he had a higher responsibility.
Well, yeah, you make the big bucks, you should have more responsibility. So the situation is that if you make profits, you keep them, and if you make losses, we pay for them. That sounds good to me, yes. <laughs> He can't find 1.6 billion dollars. Son of a gun! I had it somewhere. Where did I put it? I don't. I don't know. And if things go right, they pocket the profits and the bonuses. And if things go wrong, the worst that happens to them is they don't have that bonus. And if it goes bad, who cares? It's not my money anyway. I say to the government, "You deal with it, man. That's your bad Portuguese debt." So what are you going to do? Are you going to be a sucker and only make 200,000? No. You're going to put it in as risky a stuff as you can to make as much money in the short term as you possibly can because it ain't your money anyway. And you have no downside. And now do you see why bankers both are robbing us for, by getting the free money and be incentivized to take the greatest possible risk? Because they might not even be at Goldman. That particular executive might not be at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or wherever in a couple of years. He thinks in a couple of years that I'm here or shoot in the five, ten years that I'm here. I got to take as much money home as possible. They're giving me free money and they're letting me take whatever risk I want with it. Yet for a time, it seemed as if modern bankers had solved this age-old problem. They really thought they were smarter than the Medici. Many Wall Street executives say wrongdoing is necessary. There was a recent ethics survey of 500 senior executives on Wall Street. While 24% said they believed financial services professionals may need to engage in unethical or illegal conduct to be successful. What is happening with this generation? These are disappointing numbers. All right, well that number is really closer to 100% because you take the LIBOR scandal, it's the bedrock rate that's referenced and indexed used to create hundreds of trillion, 800 trillion in derivatives around the world. It's manipulated. Everyone involved with that. Well, you know, Bob Diamond got caught committing a felony. You know, his response was like he had just been voted off a reality uh, TV show. So he's all smiles and it's the debriefing from the, oh, you're, you had to come out of the bank. You, you were caught for committing a felony. You ripped millions of people off. How do you feel now? And he's there all smiles and, you know, will he work for Blackstone? Will he work for private equity? Will his next job, will he get to keep his 20 million pound bonus? Yeah, all that stuff is going to kick in. He's happy. There's not even any negative stigma, much less a penalty. He, he's just an interview like this guy is ready to go to Disneyland and celebrate his triumph as having stolen 20 million and more pounds without a single penalty. So there is a real notion of shame in these countries when they steal money. That's something you don't see in the UK. That's something you don't see in America. There's no idea of shame. The stealing is not a shameful act in America or the UK at this time. As a matter of fact, it's celebrated as a reason to hold these people up and lionize them. When Jamie Dimon goes in front of Congress, he storms in like a conquering hero because he's one of the biggest thieves of them all. There's no shame in Jamie Dimon's dictionary. Uh, so this is a, a very interesting culture clash between the East and West. So again, he's a gaming hero to this gaming culture because he can push buttons really fast and steal faster than anybody else. That makes him a hero. He's a, he's a guitar hero, Jamie Dimon. I can steal faster than anyone else in the world. Everything's changed. In, in what way? Well, in, in, the, in the sense that nothing has changed. Now when you get his suspicion, finger pointing, everybody asking all sorts of, all sorts of difficult questions. Uh, what, what sort of questions? Oh, well. Yeah, I you know the sort of nitpicking, pointless things like, um, well, I don't know, you know, where's the money gone? <laughs> As if I'm supposed to know. <laughs> but it's generally thought that it is people like you who are responsible for this uh, crisis. Yes, well, I think that's broadly true, yes. <laughs> yes, we've given far too much credit, we've been paid far too much, and we've been stupidly greedy. <laughs> So who got the money? To financial institutions in, in Europe and other countries. Which ones? I don't know. Half a trillion dollars and you don't know who got the money? Which institutions received it and how much for each institution? Uh, I don't know which institutions, which specific institutions received it. But and who got the money? Hundreds and hundreds of banks. Any bank or that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. You tell us who they are. No. To hand out a half a trillion dollars to foreigners? 
without any action by this Congress? Sorry. In other words, isn't that too bad? They took the money, but they don't want to be public about the fact that they received it. Wouldn't it necessarily affect the credit markets if you extend a half a trillion dollars in, in credit to anybody? Big banks can have a better model. How much of this 1.5 trillion pounds that has been given to the banks, can I ask, uh, how much of that is going towards your bonus? Well, you, uh, see, I knew it. I knew it. It was all about bonuses. David Ruffin. Uh, Mr. Diamond, the Bank of England have pointed out that because you're too big to fail and because the taxpayer stands behind you, as a result of that you're much more credit worthy and therefore can borrow money much more cheaply than if you were standing alone. They calculated, the bank, that that's worth £100 billion pounds a year to the big five banks. Are you grateful to the British taxpayer for subsidising you in this way? There's a couple of answers to this. No, I, no, I, are you grateful to the British taxpayer? Why do you feel so compelled to do this? And in the end, could this cost several hundred billion dollars? Uh, Harry, these companies are so big and so interwoven into the uh, financial markets and our financial system, we, we had no choice. And this is accepted that you're too big to fail. And the taxpayer stands behind you. That makes you more creditworthy. It means you can borrow much more cheaply than if you're a standalone organization. Now, what I'm asking you, Mr. Diamond, is are you grateful to the British public? And you have to bear in mind that in running a complaint, one is up against a very professional organization, a bank and its complaint handlers, and they're designed not to give people money give people as little as they can if they have to hold their hands up. It's quite a fight and they will try and extract information which can make them present the story in a different way and we stop that happening because we get the truth, we get the facts and then we present them properly. All this lot here are our Barclays files. Uh, they're the Barclays Ombudsman Service files. There's another bunch in there which haven't yet got to the Ombudsman Service. But these are mostly people who invested in the global income funds, which were wildly over-described and were very risky. Uh, they, these are the giant banks that actually are mythical. They don't exist uh, because they couldn't possibly exist. You know, you can't, uh, physically impossible, economically impossible. There's 600 trillion in derivatives around the world that they're engaged in over a quadrillion in transactions. The earth itself only has 50 trillion in GDP. So clearly these things are part of the imaginary banking hologram that exists only in the minds of a few ideologue crackpots. <laughs> Yeah. 
the banks, it's not that they're too big to fail, it's that they're too big to exist. Uh, th there's no business model that they could be involved with that would support that size that they claim to be. Uh, they are all flow, no assets. <laughs> The book value of the company, as Reggie Middleton has said on this show a few times, is less than zero. These are strange times in finance. Everything seems to be built on hunches and trends. Is it too much to ask for a little insight and sound judgment? Maybe it's our devotion to these principles that's made us a bit more substantial. Can I help you? Oh, Bob Diamond is a suicide banker. Jamie Diamond is a suicide banker. Lloyd Blankfein is a suicide banker. They're willing to blow themselves and their institutions up in the name of an ideology, market fundamentalism, with the uh, precept of infinite growth and to obliterate millions using interest rate apartheid. That's their ideology. They're, they're terrorists. The second thing is we also need the governments and public policy to support that. So if you go way back in the U.S. to the early days of, of small businesses getting loans, you remember the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and the government created some credit guarantee on that to encourage banks to do it. So we're also working with um, international agencies. We're working with governments in Africa to create mortgage guarantee programs, credit guarantee programs. Um, public policy can also help by providing guarantees. So if they want to encourage lending to farmers into agriculture, um, the World Health Organization will provide credit guarantees, domestic economies can, so that banks aren't carrying all the risk of potential failure. But how did they bring home the cash? Barclays shifted the focus from high street banking to trading on the international financial markets, some of which has been criticised as casino banking. The power inside that bank passed away from the old-fashioned bankers to the casino operators like Bob and his gang. Genuinely, there were quite a few profits, but some of the profits and the super profits were coming by taking an extreme risk. Well, Barclays say many banks were involved in the aggressive pursuit of profit. They reject the term casino banking and point out that the investment bank has raised around a trillion pounds for UK businesses. Bonuses at Barclays have reduced significantly since 2008, but bonuses have far outweighed what the bank has paid to its owners, the shareholders. I think that investment banking is, says it's for the shareholder, but actually is a machine for the enrichment of investment bankers. Carol Williams is an academic who we asked to study Barclays accounts. He says the investment bank dominates the business. The firm has partly been captured by its investment banker workforce and the commitment of resources to Barclays Investment Bank is much more in the interests of the senior investment bankers than it is in the interests of the shareholders or the public. You can see why people might suggest that Barclays was being run for the benefit of its employees. Over the course of 2010 and 2011, Barclays paid its shareholders, the people who actually own the company, £1.4 billion. Over the same period, Barclays paid its staff £6 billion in bonuses. There's absolutely no doubt that they were an expensive shareholders, they were coming out of shareholders' pockets. Martin Taylor was chief executive of Barclays until 1998. At the time, he questioned Barclays' expansion of its investment bank. The value in the investment bank seemed to be going, even in the 1990s, to the people who worked in it. And the shareholders were underwriting the risk. That was what worried me. I don't think anybody in the investment banking industry deserves the amount of money they're being paid. I think the amount of money that is paid is um, utterly unjustified and has been for quite a long time. 
Barclays says it pays less than many investment banks and that dramatically cutting pay would result in key staff leaving the business. So what about Bob? What was he on? Well, you might think a bank, more than most employers, would know how much they were handing over. So we asked Barclays to give us a figure for Bob Diamond's pay for the years he was a director. We asked lots of times. We asked for months. We got nowhere. Barclays told us that we were unable or unwilling to complete the simple task of compiling this information from the relevant public documents. They told us to look in 36 different places in their annual reports. They said the answer is in there. We did look and so did our experts. It would take you hours and hours if not weeks to actually get to the bottom of all this. You need a team of people working on this for several days. But if you actually look, you can see it's all over the place. You have to look there, there, there and there. It's sort of on four or five pages. Our best estimate is that in six years, Bob took home about £120 million in cash and shares. Barclays says a single figure for Bob's pay is a potentially very misleading and oversimplified approach. So where's the money coming from to fund the seven-figure bonuses? Well, Panorama has gone inside a controversial department that flourished in Bob Diamond's investment bank. Barclays doesn't like talking about it, but it's called Structured Capital Markets, or SCM. Given its size, what SCM did was amazing. It only employed 100 people, but managed to make around a billion pounds a year in profit. Now 140,000 people work for Barclays, but this tiny team was generating a significant chunk of the bank's total profits. So how on earth did they do it? So Structured Capital Markets, SCM, was that there when you were at the bank? Um, yes, it was. Uh, there, was um, there was a business within the investment bank, relatively modest scale, um, very profitable. What was it for? Uh, it was for tax planning, tax structuring, um, for international business mostly. Is that tax avoidance? Um, it's tax avoidance, yes. He pioneered the idea of guaranteed bonuses, so it didn't matter how badly you did, uh, you just get your guaranteed bonus. And that became, you know, what well, some people have said to me, that was almost like a cancer that spread across the city. A company that is using their talents to become one of the fastest growing investment banks. Investment banking is the same as the Premier League. The more you pay, the higher you finish up the league table in the Premier League. The same with investment banking. Of course, private companies can pay what they like, and other investment banks pay their staff well too. But Barclays has been criticised for continuing to pay high bonuses even after the financial crisis in 2008. In 2011, Barclays paid nearly £2.6 billion in bonuses. But what about the people who actually own the bank, the shareholders? So what does it feel like to be a shareholder of Barclays today? Pretty grim. I mean, Robert Muriel's uh, been a Barclays shareholder for 30 years. But in recent years, his dividend, the payment on his shares, has been slashed. He's written to the bank dozens of times over the years. And what did you, what did you tell the bank? What was your view? Well, the view was that these payments were excessive. I realised the people were making money for the bank at the time but I couldn't see any need for any one individual to get that sort of reward. But tax avoidance at Barclays was done on a spectacular scale. It was enormous. It was enormous. I mean, it was a very major... Tax avoidance was a very major profit centre for the whole of Barclays. It's as if their, their office in Canary Wharf was a sort of offshore, offshore island completely divorced from the, you know, the rest of Britain. Company. We've been given confidential documents which show the shape of one SCM tax avoidance scheme. Barclays sits there. That's the Luxembourg Bank. That's the finance. Staff lent billions of pounds to a bank in Luxembourg via complex structures and a company in the Cayman Islands. 
Down at the bottom here, we've still got our two and a half billion. Barclays drew up the whole structure. It's like some sort of nightmare IKEA map. Somehow, all of this helped Barclays exploit the system and avoid millions in tax. There's something else here, which has got 120 million in dividend. And there's Barclays up at the top. SCM paid some of Barclays' biggest bonuses. We've been told the bonus pool was 10% of profits, which would mean in its best year, 100 people shared 100 million pounds. Which brings us to the biggest deal of all. Back in 2008, Barclays was in trouble. It looked like they might have to ask for a government bailout. In 2008, the whole world banking system was in crisis and the British banks in particular were in terrible trouble. Barclays perfectly reasonably were desperate to avoid a rescue. So why was Barclays keen to stay out of government control when other banks were bailed out? Well, Barclays has made much of the fact that it remained independent. But some say there's another reason, the same old reason, bonuses. They were prepared to do anything to avoid going to the taxpayer because that would have required um, limits on bonuses. It would have, uh, it would have undermined the, the culture that Bar Bob Diamond was known for. Barclays deny bonuses were a factor. They had been told, like all banks, to increase the amount of their reserves. By October 2008, they found themselves with just a couple of weeks to find the cash. We've been told they went to some surprising places to try and get it. In the end, it didn't matter. Two other groups in the Middle East were happy to provide the cash. Seven billion pounds, mainly from the Gulf states of Qatar and Abu Dhabi. It came at almost credit card rates of up to 14%. The Qatar deal is under investigation by the Serious Fraud Office and the Financial Services Authority. But we think the Abu Dhabi side of the deal raises questions too about Barclays' relationship with a Middle Eastern sheikh. Back in 2008, Barclays told the world the Sheikh was giving it more than three billion pounds. Shareholders were told the same thing and voted to accept the deal. But Panorama has noticed something odd. It was buried deep in paperwork that was issued the day after the shareholders gave their approval. So, on page 44 of this prospectus, it says that Sheikh Mansour has arranged for his investment to be funded by an Abu Dhabi government investment vehicle, which seems like the Abu Dhabi government was providing the cash and not Sheikh Mansour. And when we started delving deeper, we found more contradictions in the Barclays paperwork. Barclays filings to the US government suggest the Abu Dhabi government is the investor, not Sheikh Mansour. But Barclays annual report, the document it sends to shareholders, talks about Sheikh Mansour in two separate years. And the problem for Barclays is they both can't be right. So Barclays misled the public and its shareholders over one of the biggest investments in its history. But that is not the only reason why our discovery might be important. Although Sheikh Mansour's money didn't save Barclays, he did play a crucial role in the deal. He was chairman of the Abu Dhabi investment vehicle that provided the funding. He's a government official. If it turns out Sheikh Mansour profited personally from the deal, it might look like a bribe. До вас нужно довести, чтобы в других вы увидели наконец себя, или вы по-прежнему чувствуете себя избранным.